His name is uh, Dr. Daniel Mahoney. He's a <coughs> professor and chair of the Department of Political Science at Assumption College in Worcester, Massachusetts. He received his bachelor's degree from Holy Cross and his master's and PhD from the Catholic University of America. Uh, I'm aware of at least six books that uh, Dr. Mahoney has uh, published or edited, and he showed me the galleys for, is it book number seven, or is it book number eight, or no, nine? Uh, with edited collections, it's book number 10. Book number 10, so I'm yes. way behind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, book number 10. Uh, and his area of expertise, I, I, I have a hard time characterizing, I would call it uh, European thought. Uh, he has edited or written books on Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Bertrand de Juvenel, Charles de Gaulle, and Raymond Aron. Uh, the last web, the, the website I uh, consulted suggested there were 122 articles, 120 or more than 120 articles, essays, and, and reviews. I'm sure it's closing in on 200 now. Uh, there yeah, are people, that website hasn't been uh, updated in a long time. Okay, uh, there are people who bleed ink. Uh, and when that made sense. Now, he bleeds pixels, okay? Uh, he is a res the recipient of the very distinguished uh, Prix Raymond Aron. Uh, and also, at least according to, now this is a more recent website, I think, holds, and you can tell me if I'm wrong about this, holds the Augustine Chair and Distinguished Scholarship at the That is correct. Uh, named after St. Augustine. Named after St. Augustine. Some of you may be aware, uh, familiar with St. Augustine. Uh, in attempting to entice uh, students to attend this beyond the, uh, the, the carrots I dangle in terms of extra credit, I also uh, told them, and I, 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 I'm going to put uh, Dr. Mahoney on the spot here, uh, I told him that he was one of the four funniest professors I'd ever had the pleasure of meeting. Uh, one of the other four is the uh, recently departed uh, Peter Lawler. Uh, at least one of the others has also been on this campus, and I've been working hard to get number four. And when I do, I'll let you know. Uh, but so without further ado, I will uh, give you uh, Dr. Dan Mahoney. And at some point, uh, someone may come in and give us a little more light up here, and we'll just have to uh, you know, take a little break while that happens. If not, uh, he will shed light sufficient for all of us from by his room. Thank you very much. Thank you for that very gracious introduction. My eyes are not so good, and it really is dark here, and I'm talking off of notes, so I will do my best. Um, my, uh, Joe mentioned uh, uh, Peter Lawler, our late uh, lamented friend, and uh, one of Peter Lawler's, Lawler's great virtues was the way he thought about what he called the relational person. And that might be a good way to start my talk today. It seems to me that one of the defects of uh, liberal thought, and I don't mean liberal in the narrow sense of the left wing of the Democratic Party or the left wing of the academy, but liberal thought more broadly, the sort of animating public philosophy of the Western world. One of the defects is the tendency to reduce the human condition or the human situation to the twin poles of the individual and the state. And Peter Lawler argued, not in a cranky way, he was very impish and funny, and uh, had all sorts of funny mannerisms, but uh, Peter argued that the anthropology, the account of the human person that was put forward by liberalism was impoverished. And it was impoverished because it refused to recognize what we might call the broader context of individuality. So uh, uh, the word person, it has a certain resonance in Catholic thought. Uh, there was a whole movement in philosophy, not just Catholic, but also some secular philosophical work in the 20th century that emphasized the person, a kind of richer account of the relational human being a member of a family, of subgroups, of a, a political animal, uh, uh, you know, belonging to a richer array of, of, uh, of, of groups and associations, um, emphasized the person in contrast both to collectivism, 
the idea of a regimented human being under the auspices of a despotic collectivist state, but also individualism. I think if you look at contemporary politics and contemporary moral philosophy, and our politics has a kind of moral philosophy, it, as Lawler pointed out, inordinately emphasizes autonomy. That the human being, the free human being, is um, autonomous. Uh, there are no ends or purposes guiding human freedom. So we choose arbitrarily. It's a kind of juvenile existentialism. I'm, I'm old enough to remember the tail end of existentialism. Everything was free choice. The problem with existentialism is what do you choose? If, if everything is about commitment, everything is arbitrary, everything is relative, what's going to guide your choice? And I think that's a, that's a, a major lacuna, a major problem with modern freedom. We talk a lot about the individual. We maximize the value of individual choice, but we provide very little guidance to what, uh, to those things that guide, inform, and give direction to human choice. But the paradox is all these discontents of individualism, these exaggerated claims made on behalf of autonomy uh, have led to what I would call a communitarian reaction. Last uh, month, during the first month of this conference, you know, the March wing of the conference, my old and dear friend Patrick Deneen spoke. Uh, Pat how, how many of you heard Patrick when he was here? Yeah. Patrick is a preeminent representative of a certain kind of conservative Christian communitarianism. Uh, that's not an insult, by the way. Uh, some circles it would be an insult. It's just a description. But any, in any case, um, Patrick is somebody who argues that uh, the more, you might say, the liberal proposition has worked itself out, the more we've come to resemble as a people, as a culture, as a polity, the more we come to resemble the sort of abstract account of the human individual put forward by the early modern political philosophers, people like Thomas Hobbes in 17th century England, John Locke at the end of the 17th, the beginning of the 18th century. Uh, this, this idea of the sort of the, 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 the individual and the state of nature, everyone free and equal with no natural ties or bonds. Deneen's, what's sort of original about Deneen's very consistent and radical critique of philosophical liberalism is he blames both political liberals and political conservatives. He thinks conservatives are way too wedded to the market economy, to the valorization of complete individual freedom in the economic and social realm, while uh, especially on lifestyle issues, the, uh, the academic and social left favors a kind of dissolution of the very idea of human nature, you know, mm -hmm. radical choice all the way down. And instead, Deneen tries to restore a richer, more variegated notion, to come back to my word before, the context of human individuality. That the human individual, the human person, can only really flourish in a social or communal context. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, Denise. this is really much easier to do in April than in March, because in March I would have had to do it in front of Deneen, and now I can criticize it behind his back, you know, which is a, gives me a little more freedom. But he's, he's, heard, he's heard my critique. In fact, we had a uh, exchange about the value of liberalism in uh, June of 2012 in the pages of uh, the, uh, the journal dedicated to religion and public philosophy, uh, First Things. Uh, let me say, a lot of what I'm going to talk about in the remainder of my remarks deals with intra-conservative discussions. I think there's a reason for this. I'm not saying that political and philosophical liberals don't have something to offer on this subject. Aristotle told us a long time ago, all the parties have something to say. You know, so be wary of any faction sect, group, 
or tendency that tells you that truth <coughs> is all on one side and the other people ought to be, ought to shut up. That, that kind of uh, totalitarianism we increasingly see on campuses, I think is very destructive of liberal learning, it's very destructive of free politics, it's very destructive of free speech. So liberals have something to say on this subject, but as Robert Nisbet argued in the 1950s in his great book, The Quest for Community, as Yuval Levin argued in 2016 in an important book, I think a wonderful book called The Fractured Republic, Renewing America's Social Contract in the Age of uh, Individualism, liberalism at least is a philosophical doctrine for an awful long time. We're going back three or four centuries now. The big, and that, Janine's book is like that. It, it starts at the beginning, at the beginning of, of philosophical modernity. But, but um, Nisbet argued as early as 1953 that um, modern thought in general and political philos and philosophical liberalism in particular tended to put forward what he called a unitary theory of democracy. So you have an abstract individual, not a person, not a relational person, but an abstract individual who is conceived as the sole bearer of rights and responsibilities. I don't know about you, but I wasn't born in a state of nature. I had a mother and father, and human beings have a long tutorial, you know. Some, some kids, you know, still are doing, undergoing that tutorial at 38. You know, but you know, you have parents who raise you, there's a social context of human individuality. But our liberalism tends to talk about it as we're just these individuals and we make these choices and we're freed from any sort of larger, multiple overlapping layers of responsibility. It's all the individual. And, um, and then there's the state, which is the guarantor, the protector of our rights. And so all the intermediate institutions, and Nisbet here was simply drawn on some of the great insights of the uh, 19th century uh, social thinker, and political sociologist, and political philosopher, Alexis de Tocqueville, that um, modern democracy and modern liberalism has a hard time giving an account, a reasoned and substantial account of all those layers of human belonging between the individual and the state. Mm -hmm. And that means churches, family, associations, voluntary groupings, what sociologists sometimes call intermediate institutions between the state and the individual. As Tuckville noted, that's the lifeblood of liberal democracy and yet our official theory has very little place for it because we have this truncated anthropology that pretty much reduces everything to the individual and the state. So uh, as Nisbet puts it, there's something single-minded about liberalism in this reduction of everything to the abstract individual and the state. Um, Tocqueville in Democracy in America, a beautiful, wonderful book that becomes more true every day, published in two volumes in 1835 and 1840 in France. I think the first volume was published in 1838 in the United States. Uh, Tocqueville says the key to the practical success of American democracy is not abstract individualism or the state, but it's rather the art of association. Let me just read you a couple of uh, key paragraphs from the second volume of Democracy in America where Tocqueville speaks about the use that Americans make of association in civil life. And by the way, one big difference between Deneen and Tocqueville, Tocqueville is probably the most quoted author in the end of liberalism, but um, Tocqueville praised the American founders for having the good sense to establish a federal republic where some political power was localized, where everything wasn't centralized, and where there was a space for what Tocqueville called, in a very elegant formulation, the art of association. 
then he thinks the whole direction, the whole animus of the American founding was for a centralized, administered republic that would gradually crowd out and abolish uh, the art of association, intermediate institutions. So it, there's, a, there's an important issue here. Is it the case that what's happening in, a, in, in the, the sort of weakening of the communal impulse, the social setting of individuality, is that simply written in the DNA of the American founding or liberal democracy? Or does it undermine and corrupt a certain understanding and set of practices that were important to earlier generations of America? Americans. I think both things are true, that there's a tendency within liberalism to reduce the human world to the twin poles of the individual and the state, and that undercuts the communal responsibilities and social context of individuality. But I also think the American founders had a Tocquevillian moment where they knew that federalism, local self-government, the art of association were important to democratic self-government. Here's a passage I really like from uh, uh, democracy in America. I always read this to my students. And this is where Tocqueville contrasts the American art of association with the French reliance on centralized government and the British reliance on some kind of aristocratic magnate. You know, we'll turn to the Lord, we'll turn to the aristocracy to take care of our problems, the French will turn to the state. But Americans instead have learned to cultivate the art of association. Americans of all ages, all conditions, and all minds are constantly joining together in groups. In addition to commercial and industrial associations in which everyone takes part, there are associations of a thousand other kinds, some religious, some moral, some grave, some trivial, some quite general and others quite particular, some huge and others tiny. Americans form associations dedicated to everything and to anything. And there's a, there's a humorous note here. It says, Americans associate to give fets, festivals, to found seminaries, to build inns, to erect churches, to distribute books, and to send missionaries to the antipodes. That's the North and South Pole. This is how they create hospitals, prisons, and schools. If finally they wish to publicize a truth or foster a sentiment with the help of a great example, they associate. Uh, whenever there is a new undertaking at the head of which you would expect to see in France, the government, and in England, some great lord in the United States, you are sure to find an association. So what's interesting about Tocqueville's analysis is Tocqueville defends a kind of communitarianism centered around the art of association. And he had the foresight, I think, to see that collectivism and individualism were part of the same process. The more individuals are atomized, the more they're cut off from relational ties with other, the less they freely and voluntarily associate in small and great enterprises, the more those tasks, the more those practices will be carried out by an increasingly centralized state or administration. So Tocqueville, I think Nisbet draws on this, Levin, Levin draws on this. They want us to see that if we want to renew deep and serious reflection on the problem of community, we have to get out of this bifurcation between the individual and the state. We need to re restore the communal aspect of human being. And by the way, here's another quote from Tocqueville. Another, and I couldn't say it more directly. The morals and intelligence of a democratic people would be no less at risk than its business and industry if government were everywhere to take the place of associations. I would say the free market right is very sensitive to the way in which our business and industry 
would be undermined if government is too omnipresent and regimenting and controlling, but less sensitive to the moral effects of such centralization and regimentation. In other words, Tocqueville's more concerned with how centralization turns us into powerless and passive and apathetic individuals. In fact, uh, I always tell my students when we study Tocqueville, for Tocqueville, individuality, which is tied to our relational character, the social context and setting of human freedom, is a wonderful thing. He wants us to be strong and assertive and energetic and self-reliant, but individualism, apathetic withdrawal from common or public life, Closing in on yourself, your friends and families is a bad thing because it weakens us and makes us more passive. Now, it seems to me one of the big differences between Tocqueville and Deneen is that uh, Deneen is pretty much a localist all the way down kind of reading his book and much of his critique of contemporary liberalism is very persuasive. He's right about the broad direction of our society, even if I think he takes the DNA argument, as I called it, too far. But in the end, he basically wants us to put our tent down on Wendell Berry's farm. Wendell Berry, the Kentucky agrarian. We're going to have these local communities of practice. Patriotism and uh, human belonging always has a localist emphasis and to me. The idea of being a patriot, love of country, I'm not denying that Patrick to loves his country, but the form that love takes is attachment to what uh, the great Anglo-Irish statesman um, Edmund Burke in his great 1790 critique of the French Revolution, reflections on the level of uh, the revolution of France called the little platoons. Well, it's the little platoons that need to be revivified, strengthened. And that's going to be the bellwether. That's going to be the underpinning of an authentic uh, American patriotism. Now, my hunch is that we can go too far with this localism. I'm very sympathetic to the Tocquevillian defense of the art of association. I'm very sympathetic to Robert Nisbet's critique of a bifurcated public philosophy that overemphasizes individual autonomy and reduces everything to the twin poles of the individual and the state. Um, I think Tocqueville's absolutely right about the weakening of intermediate institutions not only undermines the integrity of our business and industry, but it also undermines the moral health of a democracy. So in all that, I'm in agreement. But I point out in the famous passage, by the way, there's, if you read anything about Tocqueville, Tocqueville like local self-government and the art of association, the intermediate institutions. You hear it at a voluntary association. You'll hear it a thousand times. The most quoted remark from Burke is the remark about the little platoons. So recently, I was teaching a course called Ideology and Revolution, and we began with Burke's critique of the French Revolution, a remarkable critique because he saw the terror of Jacobinism and Napoleon all in November 1790 before they came on the scene. He saw the logic. He saw the direction. He saw the proto-totalitarianism of the French Revolution. But anyway, the famous remark about the little platoons being the basis of public affections Burke explicitly says that it is the first principle in a, a, in a series by which we proceed towards a love of country. And uh, those remarks, I think, are quite interesting because I think what Burke is suggesting is we have to begin with those broader social and communal attachments, neighborhood, estate, family, guild, some of those concepts are not our concepts exactly, but they were Brooks' concepts. But um, we don't stay there because it's our deep and intimate familiarity with those local forms of belonging 
that open us up to first an attachment to country and then to an attachment to the human race. By the way, I think the South is a good place to talk about this because the South is probably the part of the United States that remains most regional and particularist, but it's also the most patriotic part of the country, the part of the country where more people volunteer, for example, to join the armed forces. And it's also among the most religious parts of the country. And that would all make sense for Tocqueville. The combination of local and regional attachments, the patriotism, the religious affirmation, he would see that of a piece. That's sort of the old America. Not the, the, not the America that Deneen laments, but an America where the abstractions of liberalism are held at bay by the art of association, by patriotic attachment, by the little platoons, by the art of association. Um, so I'm going to argue that in this intra-conservative debate and discussion about the relational person, about the art of association, about the social context of individuality, uh, we cannot treat localism or regionalism as somehow sufficient unto itself. In other words, we need to restore something like Edmund Burke's notion that affection for the little platoons eventually, gradually, but seriously leads us to a broader affirmation of the public and national good. Now, Deneen would be one of those conservatives who would argue, I think quite rightly, Yuval Levin makes this argument. Levin is much more friendly to the ultimate complementarity of what he calls the middle layers of social belonging, communal belonging, uh, political affirmation, and patriotism. But he says, you've got to start at the middle layers. You've got to start with the little platoons, because that's where the affections and attachments. You can't have community at the national level. You can go back to the beginning of the 20th century, and there were a whole series of uh, progressive thinkers, uh, capital P progressives, the progressive movement. And they spoke about Herbert Crowley, for example, in a famous book in 1912, talked about um, building community at the national level. The problem is we are not relational people at the national level. We do not, by the way, think of the great uh, sobering example of the French Revolution. Its motto, its famous motto, was liberté, égalité, et fraternité. The Count of Chambord, an aristocrat turncoat, become radical revolutionary, once said, I love this phrase, be my brother or I will kill you. <laughs> I think in a few words that sums up what went wrong with the French Revolution. The effort to impose politically enforced community and fraternity at the national level. By the way, I don't think Herbert Crowley and the progressive reformers of the 1910s and 1920s wanted to kill us. But I think they were mistaken in this confidence that we could build relational community at the national level, that it could replace. You know, so I think Yuval Levin in the Fractured Republic makes a I think a really good case that um, it's mistaken uh, to treat the national community as a village with communal bonds, as a famous American politician once said, it takes the village. You know, look, ser searching for that relationality and community at an inappropriate level. So I think that <coughs> argument of Le Levin in the Fractured Republic and Deneen in the End of Liberalism, that, uh, um, uh, that search for national community in important, not in every respect, but in important respects is misplaced. On the other hand, 
I think where Levin is really helpful is in arguing in his book that the search for enhanced relational community, the strengthening of the Tocquevillian art of association, the dual rejection of the extremes of individualism and collectivism should not lead us to give up, I quote uh, Yuval Levin, on national unity and pride. Let me quote Levin. Quite the contrary, but it does suggest that what is requ required to address the particular excesses and troubles of our age is a new rootedness that will be communal before it is national. Um, in other words, we're only going to restore a meaningful, assertive, measured, serious, self-critical patriotism if it builds on those affections, those attachments made possible by Burke's Little Platoons and Tocqueville's Art of Association. So I think what Levin is arguing for is a healthy national identity, what the British uh, philosopher Roger Scruton calls humane national loyalty, but built from the bottom. In other words, gaining strength and energy and seriousness from a renewal of those middle layers of belonging and community. And again, I find this argument, the Levin argument, to be more compelling and attractive than the Deneen argument because it takes seriously the fact that the local, uh, the regional, the local, the particular, takes place within a larger context, a variegated national republic. And to say, you know, Madison says in Federalist 39 that the founder, founders aimed to build a republic that was partly national and partly federal. Let's take them at their words. Let's reinvigorate those parts of our tradition that can act as a check on, on, on undue centralization. But at the same time, let's not succumb to, and I think it is a bit of a reactionary sentiment, to, uh, we, how many of you have heard of this uh, Benedict option of Ron Dreher? Ron, Ron Dreher is a former evangelical turned Roman Catholic turned Orthodox. He's, uh, uh, that's a lot of switches. But uh, Ron Dreher has written this book, The Benedict Option, that's actually recently been translated into French and Czech. Uh, but Ron Dreher's book uh, calls for a kind of withdrawal. It takes off from some lines at the end of uh, a famous book after virtue by the English, uh, the Scottish philosopher Alistair MacIntyre, who essentially argues modernity has played itself out in a kind of moral corruption, an untenable individualism, an inability to defend moral norms and virtues, and decent people have to withdraw uh, into commu communities where the old verities can be renewed, waiting for a new St. Benedict, waiting for a renewal of Western civilization. I have a, I have a bunch of problems with the uh, Benedict option. One, I think it's probably too pessimistic. The world, as my late friend Peter Lawler used to like to say, is always getting better and worse at the same time. Not just, not just worse. Uh, secondly, um, the, uh, you need a somewhat healthy national republic with a, a publicly recognized acceptance of localism. And you need, you need national political activity to safeguard things like homeschooling and the rights of association and religious liberty. I think one of the most disturbing trends that uh, Driver is very sensitive to is the way many progressives today, they have this mentality. By the way, did anyone ever notice that for 75 years the Soviet Union referred to their ideology as the progressive doctrine? You know, all, all right is on one side and the rest are enemies to be crushed. 
Well, when you think that way, people who advocate uh, traditional marriage or against abortion on demand or uh, have doubts about transgenderism, if they're all evil and have to be crushed and their rights taken away and their civil liberties repressed, uh, you're, not, you're not talking about liberty. You're talking about a dogmatism that wants to impose a new morality at the expense of civic freedom and civil discussion. So I'm very sympathetic to Dreyer's cultural analysis, but I would say you can't give up on the country. You can't give up on the country. And if you want to create a space for the better adoption, or even, I think, I think Yuval Levin's uh, formulations and thinking about this are more calibrated and they're more moderate, uh, the middle layers. The middle layers occur within a larger republic and you have to have you have to have courts that don't undermine religious liberty. You have to have a national politics that is sensitive to things like religious freedom. Uh, you can't just bow out. You can't just wait for Godot or Saint Benedict, because even that option of a dignified retreat from national politics will be undermined by an aggressive ideological progressivism. And by the way, I said, it, I said there's good things about liberalism. And honest liberalism would be on the side of free speech, religious liberty, uh, free debate and discussion. It would not consider uh, the other side, half the human race, on these great and contested social questions to be enemies of the people uh, who are self-evidently haters. Like in the Supreme Court, in the uh, in uh, its decision on same-sex marriage more or less suggested that all the traditional uh, arguments in favor of appropriate of marriage, sexual complementarity, the traditional family were rooted in irrational animus. Well, that's crazy. Uh, if, if the Supreme Court majority couldn't come up with a single argument from philosophy or religion or civic traditions in favor of a traditional understanding of fa family, they weren't looking very hard and they weren't addressing the issue with sufficient civic generosity. So I say the localist, uh, the rekindling of local attachments in Yuval Levin's sense is a very healthy development. But with Deneen and Dreyer, we have a tendency for localism to divorce itself from larger national, political, and patriotic attachments. I think it's a mistake. I think it's an excessive form of withdrawal from public life. By the way, I mentioned that in Deneen's book, the most quoted and cited author is uh, Alexis de Tocqueville. Alexis de Tocqueville, in a letter in 1835, called himself a strange kind of liberal, because he was friendly to religion friendly to the art of association. Uh, uh, he wanted in his famous words at the end of the chapter on the Puritan roots of American freedom at the end of volume one of Democracy in America. He said he wanted to bring together the spirit of liberty and the spirit of religion. I, I, I suppose one of my students would tell me that's a violation of the separation of church and state. All well, the First Amendment says is you can't establish a religion. It doesn't say that the polity, the political community, has to be neutral between religion and irreligion. And in fact, Tocqueville's great insight in 1835 and 1840 was that America had the wisdom of separating church and state while rejecting, you might say, the French alternative, going back to the revolution, of understanding liberty in opposition to the truths of religion. So uh, the other thing I want to mention about Tocqueville, so Tocqueville saw himself as a friend of the American founding, unlike Denis. He saw himself as some kind of liberal, obviously not that Hobbes lack liberal with the atomization of individualism, but as some kind of liberal, defending the regime of religious and civil liberty. You have to think about Tocqueville, that all the little platoon guys leave out, is, as Raymond Aron once said when he received the uh, Tocqueville Prize in France in 1981, Tocqueville was a bit of a Gaullist. Charles de Gaulle was the great French 
statesman of the 20th century, who led the resistance during World War II, founded the French Fifth Republic in 1958, uh, was prickly in his relations with the United States. He believed in a form of grandeur, of French greatness, even though France's means in the world were reduced. But um, Tocqueville was a big defender of national pride. And uh, he liked the term national greatness. But France would play an active role in the world. And he thought national greatness was one way of overcoming individualism, people rallying to the country, and the country having a larger mission of the world, partly to promote liberty, but simply to, partly to, uh, to, to, to give people a common purpose. And um, so Tocqueville wasn't just uh, pitching his tent on an 1830s version of Wendell Berry's farm. He was also this proto-Gaulist who wanted a strong France that was active in the world, uh, John Stuart Mill once wrote this letter to Tocqueville because, uh, believe it or not, in 1841 there was a diplomatic crisis between England and France and they almost went to war. John Stuart Mill is m much more of a classical liberal than Tocqueville. He writes this letter to Tocqueville and he says, how, oh my God, in the 19th century, how could two free commercial peoples go to war? And Tocqueville said, I'd rather have the risk of war, I'd rather have France standing up for her national interests and taking things seriously than everyone sitting on their couches like couch potatoes, you know? So uh, Tocco was worried about that, that indifference, that apathetic withdrawal. Mill was more open to a kind of liberalism where people did their own thing. So I bring this up about Tocqueville, not because I want to get mired in the details of Tocqueville's um, uh, uh, political philosophy, but just to make the point that it's possible to combine a strong emphasis on patriotic and national attachment with this calibrated emphasis on localism, self-help, and the art of association. Let me end on this note. I want to draw your attention to two European thinkers who um, defend the nation, but do so on the ground that humane national loyalty is a form of defending, come back to Yuval Levin's phrase, the middle layer of political and social life. The first is uh, Pierre Menant, the French uh, Catholic political philosopher, the student of Raymond Aron, Raymond Aron, but we Americanized shamelessly. You know, not like those people at NPR who say Nicaragua. No, no. It's Nicaragua in America, it's Raymond Aron in America. So, um, anyway, Manan uh, uh, says that in a globalized world where the, cult, where the emphasis is on cosmopolitanism, on globalism, remember the motto of the 80s, we are the world. If you're an undergraduate here today, you will be subjected to endless, nauseating, cosmopolitan propaganda, globalizing the curriculum. You will never hear about the virtues of attachment to the country you actually belong to. You will hear about attachment to a world that in some sense doesn't exist. I'm being a little polemical here. But my point is, in such a situation, as Manat argues, uh, the old realities, like the nation and religion, are legitimate realities that we need to take into account. Manant even calls them intermediary communities in which human beings actually live. So I think for American localists like Dreyer and Deneen, they think of the nation as this big, centralizing, collectivist, administer behemoth snuffing out local responsibility and freedom. The Europeans, like Pierre Menant and the British uh, philosopher Roger Scruton, looking at the Europe behemoth, looking at Brussels, looking at the drive toward cosmopolitan political forms, they look upon the nation as an intermediate institution that grounds self-government, that allows federalism and the art of association. Uh, a true intermediate body faced between the world and the pressures 
of democratic individualism. Let me read uh, Roger Scruton, who's a friend of mine. Uh, he writes uh, like four books a year on music, aesthetics, politics, conservatism. They're all rich. They're all beautifully written. Uh, but he, he quit the academy in 1993, and he lives by writing books. 47 of them. I've got 37 to go. I don't know if I can do it. I can't do it. But anyway, um, he has a new book out, uh, kind of inspired by Brexit, you know, the, the narrow decision by referendum of the British people to depart from the European community. So he published a book in late 2017 called Where We Are, The State of Britain Now. Just a few lines. He says, this is the residual idea of national identity that I defend in this book. The idea of a shared home and a territorial jurisdiction. So the nation is a territorial democracy that has other forms of layered community within it. And this is what uh, Scruton adds. It is neither belligerent. Scruton likes to say Germany, the German nation, was a threat to the world in the 1930s and 40s because it was first and foremost a threat to itself. There is nothing belligerent or imperialistic, per se, about humane national loyalty and attachment. Secondly, the idea is not mystical. It's not any reasoned attachment to one's own, but a form of self-government. And, Scruton adds, such loyalty, such national identity, does not depend on extinguishing the many other loyalties that its participants may have. The local, the communal, the familiar, the religious. There, there have been idolatrous forms of the nation. You know, where people adopted a homicidal aversion to other people. But this is not the form of national identity and attachment that Menandra Scruton and myself are defending. So my very modest proposal for this interconservative debate about national loyalty and localism is I think there is an element of truth uh, both in the insistent conservative emphasis on the little platoons and the art of association certainly as a corrective to this bifurcated anthropology which reduces human beings to the twin poles of the individual state. But I also fear that a one-sided emphasis on the local and the particular <coughs> fails that necessity of some assent, as, as Burke says, that our affections that are kindled or rekindled in the little platoons have to lead us to a broader affection for country. And in the present context or climate, where national affirmation is confused with homicidal imperialism or hatred of others or xenophobia, that's what I mean by the cosmopolitan propaganda you hear on campuses. You know, you're all, uh, it's all the other, the other, the other, the other whatever that means, and these slogans, these ide ideological slogans here. In this context, a humane national loyalty is a defense of the middle layer, of the, inter inter uh, of the intermediate realm against a one-sided cosmopolitanism on the one hand. It's too easy, too facile to love the world. Uh, quite compatible with hating real human beings. And on the other side, an individualism where people succumb to apathetic control and are at the mercy of those larger collectivists and administrators. Tom has a wonderful line somewhere in Democracy in America. It's in volume one where he's talking about the importance of local self-government in New England. And he said, local self-government helps people be citizens and not administrés, administered ones. There's a difference between being an active citizen partakes in self-government and having, calling yourself an individual, but having all the details of your life administered by somebody else. Anyway, what I did today was a little bit of thinking aloud in dialogue with some of the people who were here for the first month of the conference, and um, I hope these thoughts are helpful for thinking about the problem of community, 
and for thinking about how, how to think about community in a, a humane and balanced way, how to get out of that false liberal anthropology that reduces everything to the individual and the state. And I'm going to end there. Thank you. We may have classes uh, soon, and, and uh, we're going to take a, 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 like a minute break for people who have to leave to leave, and then uh, Dr. Mahoney says he will uh, take questions. I'm Absolutely. Sure. I did pretty well for a man who couldn't see my notes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Maybe you want to okay. Are you, John? I'll try. I have a Will you come for drinks? I'll try. Okay. Oh. We'll see you later then. Okay. Okay. Let me let me launch the questions. Then. Sure. Uh, uh, you know, we, in, in Mark Lilla's Once and Future Liberal, he talks about. Uh, you know, the individualism of Reaganism and then uh, the kind of national community that, that Roosevelt uh, builds or attempted to build and uh, argues that uh, there has to be some effort to rebuild the kind of national community. And your argument following Burke and others is that you get to national community from local community. And it's the start. Yes, yeah, the start. Uh, and you know, even, even someone who uh, it allegedly lays the foundation for the French Revolution and, fa and also for fascism and communism like Rousseau. In Emile says, uh, you know, the basis of Emile's citizenship is the fact that he becomes a, a husband and father. You start with the, the real particular responsibilities and you gain a kind of measured interest in politics and in the nation because you have real responsibilities to real people. It's not an abstraction. That's right. So I, I guess what I'd ask you to do is to think about, think aloud, as you have been, about the, the contrast between uh, a patriotism that begins from uh, the little platoons and a patriotism that begins from the high level of the nation. It, are, the, are the critiques of nationalism as you know, ethnocentrism, hatred, violence, and so on, better directed at uh, you know, the kind of abstract nationalism and is the patriotism that grows out of the little platoons more proof against that kind of... Uh, well, those are all great questions. And by the way, at some level, I agree with Mark Lillo that especially uh, the subtitle of your conference, this uh, age of ideological polarization, we do need an enhanced emphasis on na national community. But where I think Yvonne Levin is helpful is in reminding us that uh, the affections, the affectionate attachment to a common cause, to a country, to a common sense of purpose, isn't going to start there. It, uh, it, it has to build in a more layered way on those forms of attachment that we're actively engaged with and involved in. Local government, federalism, the art of association are very important in that, in that way. Uh, our citizenship becomes more concrete and less uh, abstract. Um, about nationalism, uh, Pierre Menant likes to say, the literature critiques a pathology, nationalism, without talking about the phenomena, which is humane national loyalty. And Scruton also makes that argument, I alluded to his comment about the Germans, that uh, they, uh, they uh, they cause such havoc for everyone else because they cause such havoc for themselves. I think when the nation was tied to a broader notion of civilization, the West, biblical religion, Christianity, no civilized uh, European or American believe that love of one's own and love of one's country gave one a justification for a murderous, homicidal aversion to your neighbors. You know, um, somebody said about Hitler in the 30s and 40s that he had uh, restored zoological wars, you know, this idea of fundamental hatred and animosity toward one's neighbors. 
I just don't think it's compatible with Western civilization. Um, and um, um, so we make a terrible mistake if we confuse the totalitarian subversion of the nation with traditional forms of national self-affirmation. I think that's the problem. Let's be frank, it's really hard to be a German because trying to be a German conservative and actually say it's a good thing to be a German, we have this rich history, uh, uh, we're a cultured and civilized people, we have this horrible 12 year episode, the Third Reich. Germans, are, it's gonna take them hundreds of years to learn the language of legitimate, humane, national self-affirmation because the tendency is to, a perfectly understandable tendency, is to, re, uh, to react to this totalitarian, imperialist subversion of patriotism. But uh, Hitler was no traditional patriot. And uh, so that's a, that's, that, that's a problem. I do think um, um, a nationalism, I prefer Scruton's phrase, humane national loyalty, that recognizes a multiplicity of legitimate attachments. And that means the attachments from below, the little platoons, the Tocqueville Associate of Art. But it also means not abstract cosmopolitanism, but natural law. That we're not, we're not free to do anything to any other people. That, um, that our liberty, uh, Tocqueville had a wonderful phrase in the old regime of the revolution. He talked about liberty under God and the law. You know, it's not. Um, National self-affirmation can be a good thing, but not if it's some pure, unadulterated willfulness where you are free in the name of realism, or progress, or national greatness to do anything to any other people. So um, I like the work of people like Pierre Bonanza and Roger Scruton because they are doing exactly what's necessary. They're taking the focus away from the pathology that is anti-Western, anti-traditional, anti-biblical, anti-natural law, and reminding us that um, territorial democracy, the nation, has always been the frame and hope, hope uh, home of democratic self-government. That uh, if you look in the whole modern period, there's no way we can have a regime of consent, a regime of self-government, unless it has a place, a territory and that territory is the nation state. And the idea you're gonna get rid of nation states and just have one big cosmopolis or one world, um, to date, we don't know of any other home for democratic self-government but the nation. So one of our tasks is to rehabilitate the nation, but the rehabilitation of the nation is always gonna be tied to this repudiation of the, the ideological and monstrous distortion of the nation, which was that pathological hatred that informed fascism and national socialism and its own right communism with its uh, deformed form of universalism. So, uh, yeah, but I, uh, you know, with the conservatives like Deneen, I, I just think they think the nation is just another excuse for governmental power and for weakening the local and uh, um, I, uh, I, I, I read Patrick Deneen's book and I could not find a single moment, a single sentence, a single phrase that recognized the dignity of national loyalty. Yes? Oh, what was the status of building platoons and uh, associations in between the war and Germany? Were they notably absent? Or? Um, there's a book by Ralph Darendorf um, that's very interesting, that's title is Casey. Ralph Dauerdorf is a famous German sociologist, a liberal who taught at the LSC and the London School of Economics for many years, but he made an argument that of all the European states, in a way, the, what Hegel called the estates, which would be almost a leftover feudalism, you know, the classes and corporations, uh, but also Tocqueville's kind of voluntary associations, they were very strong and very rich in Germany. Who killed them? Hitler killed them. The Germany that died in 1933 was still partly feudal, partly traditional. You know, you had the King of Bavaria, 
you had municipal liberties and all of that. Nazism flattened all that. It really was the, the Nazi party, the Fuhrer, the, the massified German people. Between 1933 and 1945, all of that was crushed. And Darmdorf's argument was paradoxically that allowed for Germany's transformation into a modern democracy because Germany was a very different kind of society after 1945. That sounds like a paradoxical argument. Hitler made possible constitutional democracy in Germany. That's not really Darmdorf's point. Dar Darmdorf was an anti-Nazi, thought Hitler was a monster, but that a paradoxical side effect was um, the weakening of those uh, little platoons and therefore um, um, uh, uh, a social setting more similar to other, other European democracies. Well, it reminds me of the book William and Ford about the tyrant doesn't care that people love the tyrant, but they can't love each other. Well, that's right. And that's why, um, you know, in the little platoons quote, Burke talks about affection. Uh, Lincoln, in his first inaugural, you know, the Mr. Courts of Memory, talks about affection. We have a political science today, we talk about interests, you know, or now the left political science talks about identity, you know, which is all about your color or your sexuality or your preferences. But maybe the central, Rousseau had a good sense of this. There's a good Rousseau. I always remind my students, there's a good Rousseau. And it's a Rousseau who reminds us of the centrality of affection in politics. Uh, and uh, th that's why I say Mark Lill is on to something. We, we, you know, we can't hate each other. Charles Morat, who was the head of Axiom Francais, a uh, far-right reactionary group in France before World War II, not exactly fascist, but darn close. Uh, Charles Morat used to say, the problem with the French is they hate each other. You know, you have the monarchists and the republicans, the Catholics, the anti-Catholics, the Communist Party, the rest of France. That really was true until the goal. And the French hate each other less than they used to. But we Americans have to be very careful. Um, our polarization is making us more of a European country. I think for the first time in a long time, Americans are beginning to hate each other in that almost European way. You know, the, the conviction that the other side is the root of all evil. Uh, there's, a, there's a progressive version of that. Everyone who's on the wrong side of the social issues is uh, an enemy, enemy of the people. But there's also a conservative fundamentalism that uh, uh, sort of mirrors that attitude. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's very worrisome about the republic, the, uh, the waning of the, the sense of, look at 9-11, for about three weeks we got together. We were one country. Remember they got, they got uh, the congressman stood on the, steps of the Capitol and they think I don't think anyone could sing the Star Spangled Banner, it's too hard. And so they sang America the Beautiful off key. Does anyone remember that? It was kind of pathetic but moving at the same time. You know, these 400 congressmen who couldn't sing but they're Democrats and Republicans, we're all together. Yeah, it lasted like till the end of September and it was over. And, and perhaps, you know, partisanship, contestation, disagreement, it's going to be part of, conflict is part and parcel of democratic political life but under you know, it's commonplace. You know, I remember when I was studying uh, as a young political scientist, you hear you know, England was the first country that invented the idea of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. That you could oppose the government and still be civil and loyal and a patriot. And I think that notion is framing. And that means that um, the attachments we have as citizens are framed. So, the ideological polarization in the title, I think, is very important. That uh, when we think about community today, we have to think about ways of muting and minimizing, or at least calming down, as Michael Oakshot said, already too passionate human beings. Yes? It seems to me that one of the difficulties in trying to implement just what you have been talking about yeah. has to do with uh, call it the monetization of this at each other, whether it's the media, and the media in the broadest sense, uh, TV, uh, radio, uh, magazines, uh, they're all appealing to a, a perspective that says, this is what we need to do, or this is what is right, and the others 
are wrong. And so we, we be, we're being polarized. The, uh, the business of politics, if you will, has, has gotten that way, in my judgment. And um, so you have, it, at least in my view, we, we almost have to remove ourselves from the, the formal and the business side of these things. And yes, regroup in, in, in local and looking at local issues, local human issues. Yeah. Uh, but it's very difficult in this environment. In which it is very difficult. And by the way, local politics has become nationalized. You have yeah. uh, town halls and meetings in Vermont voting to impeach yeah. Trump. Well, that's not their business. Right. They don't. They have no. From Tocqueville's point of view, they have no special expertise to make these judgments. They have some special expertise to figure out school policy and the roads and. You know, yeah. what fence should go on the corner of Maine and State. But, uh, yeah, I agree with that. I, I would say this, though, about the media. I think it's a common argument today that, you know, we once had this old time where we had sort of a responsible, middle-of-the-road media, less polarized, and now we have Fox and MSNBC. But I think the old national media was a little less pluralistic and open than it's sometimes pretended to be. So it's part of the problem, too. Um, but I, I agree with you that um, uh, unless some effort is made to encourage respectful dialogue, that doesn't mean it won't be heated or contested, but some effort is made to recognize um, the legitimacy of disagreement. And I think it's very hard on issues like same-sex marriage or abortion or transgenderism and some issues of political economy. People moralize these issues to such an extent that they end up demonizing those who disagree with them. But I think, that's why I think on a, in a, a university or college campus, it's really important for us to be partisans of free speech. And by the way, 19-year-olds who think they're honoring free speech by shouting down a speaker. No. No. There are forms of violence that don't involve pulling people's hair, like happened at Middlebury, to the liberal professor who was interviewing Charles Murray. Shouting people down is a form of totalitarian aggression. So I like the statement that the president of the University of Chicago issued, this firm yes. commitment the civility and free speech. I think it's a place where we could all start. Yes? I'm kind of to back a little bit on top of this question. You weren't here first, and I'm good. I'm going to move up here so I can hear sure. you. Um, they talked about the role of social media and just like the, what you were mentioning about uncensored um, internet where we can find and see yeah. ideas that support what we want. How do we get these little platoons to think more broadly and nationally? when we have things like social media and the internet that use confirmational bias to separate us more and fraction us more? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I have no social media presence. Nothing depresses me more than when I write a good article for a national magazine, and then I look at the comments, and the hacks, and the ideologues, or the people say, I know nothing about that subject, but here's my opinion. They all, the most thoughtless, the most fevered, the most passionate, the most stupid, come out of the woodwork. I would eliminate all those comments. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little nostalgic for the good old days of letters to the editor. You know? You know, the editor selected them, but, you know, they weren't so crazy. Uh, but I don't know, social media, my hope is that, um, um, this, the theme of this conference is community in a polarized age. This is pseudo-community. People think they're connected. They're not connected. This is not um, a speech and reason about the advantageous and the just, as Aristotle says. It's a kind of cacophony of voices, ideologically shrill, yelling at each other, reinforcing their own prejudices. I don't think it's a healthy development. By the way, like anyone of my age, I, I, I'm glad I could find all sorts of things on the internet. I'm glad I could read my, some of my magazines online. I'm glad I can connect to friends and email. But I look, and I'm not sure that the sum total of benefits is greater than the downside. You know, a nation addicted to porn. You know, it's not a pretty picture. And uh, 
And the way the way my colleagues teach now, um, instead of uh, it's all uh, not, you know power, PowerPoint has its uses, but if that's all you do, you know. And uh, I had a, for the first time in 33 years of teaching, I had a student write an evaluation. You don't teach the notes. My job is not to get up there and say point one, point two, point three, point four. My job is to encourage thinking, debate, discussion. But when you think you're a passive receiver of information, then you don't understand what liberal learning is about. So I worry about all those things, but I have no answers. Well, kind of what I was kind of getting at was just how do we think about social media and reforming it from being just mindless comments and mindless mindlessness into more of a platform for conversation or of a platform for encouraging this broader view of nationalism. How can we transport this to one to something yeah. that is I, do, I just think the, um, you know, the social media is such a tangled knot that uh, I, I have no practical suggestions for reform. Um, um, I do wish, uh, I do wish that our, um, we had more forum, national forums, journals and such, that uh, where people from different point of views talk to each other. Um, and uh, I think that's a real problem. I think the death of the old media is, again, I said the old media wasn't nearly as even-handed. It was sort of left liberal. But it had, it had certain norms and standards that the new media don't have. And that, that's part of the problem. So I'm sorry I don't have a, a, an answer for you, but you're getting me thinking. Well, just so much happens now on there, and it's something that, it's a monster that we don't want to attack, but we can't avoid it, so. Yeah. I'm also hoping that your generation, five or 10 or 15 years from now, will begin opting out. In other words, people will disconnect from some of this stuff. They'll actually put their phones away at night. You know, when I, I eat out a lot because I'm a bachelor, and I see four or five 20-somethings all texting other people, and not a word for an hour during dinner. And the moralist in me rises to the top, and I want to go over there and say, talk to each other. And then I realize I'll, I'll just come across as an old busybody, and they'll make fun of me, so I should keep my damn mouth shut. But, uh, that, uh, but uh, you're, I, you sort of hope there'll be a, you know, a reaction to the, not only the individualist effects of some of this media, but also to the course of it, that enough people will say, I don't like this. And, um, but I, I, another thing I worry about is, why are there so many 19-year-old totalitarians? Like whenever anyone who's not left of center comes to a college campus, there's 100 people who want to shut them up. How do these 19-year-olds get so aggressive? Confirmation of bias and looking for information. Well, why are they coming out of high school thinking in such a doctrinaire and one-sided way? You, you may have seen the, the polls that have been out lately, I can't remember what source, but that uh, a majority of young people, 18 to 24, uh, fewer and fewer every year say that the value of living in a democracy is a good that's thing. Right. And, and that's, that's kind of scary to me. I'm, I'm, I'm an old baby. Right. I've got my prejudices, but not wanting democracy is not wanting it's still the best game in town. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree with you. No, those those things are disturbing. The the lessening commitment to free speech. Yeah. Um, and also the 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 number of people who say they prefer socialism to a market economy. It's a bit strange. I mean, it's one thing to be concerned about social inequity or and, and this and that, but it's another thing. Uh, the argument for a market economy in principle is a pretty strong one. But I don't think it's it's been conveyed in in, in any to any significant extent to young people. So, um, but it, 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 it worries me that um, also this um, the, you know on the whole issue of humane national attachment. Um, I, I do think young people are submitted to unremitting propaganda about the virtues of globalization. They are not, we, they, they uh, um, at my Roman Catholic college, 
the majority of the faculty think the Western tradition is a dirty thing. I hear all the time from colleagues, it's risible, it's stupid, they'll say, these 18-year-olds coming in already know the Western tradition. Where are they living? No, they don't. But there's a prejudice against, and we're the unique and culpable. We're somehow guilty and every other civilization is pure and pristine and noble and without sin and full. So this is the atmosphere. They're getting a lot of this in junior high and high school. This cosmopolitan ideology, this hatred of the nation, this downplaying of patriotism, or the assumption, as I said before, that to love a decent country like our own is the same thing as being a Nazi. You know, this is crazy, but, but I think that's out there. That's it, in the atmosphere. I think you're, uh, I enjoyed your pointing out the relationship between the little platoons and the uh, sweetness phrase of the uh, uh, humane national yeah. unity. Uh, and and that's, I think that's a good relationship to point out to people. And I was also thought thinking that, well, one difference is in emphasis. In peacetime, you can afford afford, so to speak, to emphasize the little platoons more. But in wartime, I'm thinking of shared national desires to go to war, the two world wars. You know, Uncle Sam wants you, and yeah. sending out Hollywood film stars to war say, is, bonds war, is, all, war is also all always going to have a nationalizing yeah. effect. Yeah. 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 So that so that, that's dif difference in the emphasis is... Well, I think that's right. It, partially the difference between peacetime and wartime. I think that's way, right. You know, so, yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to pose a question to the students here. Uh, Dr. Mahoney kind of characterized the, the education you received. Uh, does that does his characterization ring true to you? I would disagree. Uh, just because here at Oberthorpe, we do learn about the undervalued globalism, and I think we have a pretty good uh, understanding of what distribution of between the super liberal professors and professors from the conservative. We actually read a faction of America in, in um, Dr. Kimberly's class. So we do have a good view, of, uh, I think a well-rounded view, but I do agree that in other liberal arts schools, that's not the case. Well, what about high school? I, I guess that At high school, I think it's just- That's what I meant by the 19, mm -hmm. I've been provocative with no, the 19-year-old totalitarians. They're not getting this their first semester of college. They're coming in with these deep-seated illiberal attitudes. I think that's also part because we have textbooks that are telling us that slavery was similar to invention servitude. I think it's a kind of deception and a kind of flaw within the public school system that has been... Do you think the textbooks don't emphasize enough the self-correcting features of American democracy? I think textbooks are focused on glorifying the country and not having us understand our history and understand that we've done things wrong. You've we seen a textbook that glorifies America? Uh, well, not glorifying, but the majority of them are made in Texas, so. Okay, okay. But what I'm saying is, I think there is a lack of, of us understanding our own history, not only the good, but the bad. Both I them. asked a class, I taught a course on politics and evil. It was about 12 years ago. I asked my students the first day of class, Give me some examples um, in human history of sort of manifold evil on the political plane. And a student raised her hand and said, Joe McCarthy. Mm -hmm. Now, Joseph McCarthy, a petty little demagogue, censored by the US Senate, uh, admirable no, he undermined the anti-communist cause by accusing people who weren't communists of being communists, but the sum total of human evil in human history you know, in the century of the Gulag and the Holocaust and all that, Joe McCarthy, number one. And I thought, this is what this kid is learning in high school. He's not learning about the 35 million key people killed under Lenin and Stalin in the Soviet Union, but he's learning about Joe McCarthy. And again, I want them to learn about the demagoguery of Joe McCarthy, but I also want them to know that it's not the uh, most evident example of political evil in the modern world. But I stop there. Thank you.